at a very simple level okay uh, this whole lockdown everyone has gone into online education mm. uh, schools are shut down but if we have to ask the basic question where are children safe the answer might not be home for a lot of kids but they're still there Welcome to your new episode of Wish I Knew That Before. I'm your host Amit Pandey and here we bring on guests from different walks of life to discuss ideas, answer questions that can directly help a young adult navigate the journey of life a bit better. The guests for today's show are Jonathan and Soumya, the co-founders of Barefoot EDU, a grassroots organization focused on improving foundational learning for under-resourced communities. Barefoot not just works with kids but teachers, principals and the government bringing them under one umbrella vision and collaborating with everyone to create stimulating learning environment for the kids. Jonathan's passion for teaching started back in 2015 when as a civil engineer he met on-site mason workers and helped them learn how to reduce material waste through basic geometry. Impressed by Jonathan's method, they wanted him to teach their kids in elementary school. The challenges he faced with those children had nothing to do with the material he was teaching, but lack of attention span, not even knowing how to hold a pencil and so much more. That is when Jonathan found his calling, reforming the early education system. Soumya's story on the other hand is of a student coming from a good school but yet being dissatisfied with her education she noticed that the school didn't focus on holistic development of all the children but more on grooming and promoting ones who they knew would win awards and do well overall she wanted to remove this clear separation by finding ways for every child to achieve and thrive despite different personalities and learning methods the duo met on young india fellowship program and with a mutual desire to work in the education space they collaborated to start barefoot edu with a vision to help every child to have the foundation to think feel and act to date they have transformed over 70 anganwadi trained over 1400 teachers and impacted more than 10000 children in under resourced communities nelson mandela once said no country can really develop unless its citizens are educated so please help me in welcoming the dynamic duo who are bringing the court alive by contributing towards developing india by making sure that the future of tomorrow the kids have their wings to fly today the thought leaders the change makers jonathan mendonka and somya agarwal ye Oh well, thanks for the really lovely introduction. Yeah, you're too kind. <laughs> no, like to be honest when I was um researching you both one thing that really stood out is the the risk taking attitude like at such a young age you followed your calling and uh, went into the education space that is quite dear to my heart as well so uh, i was like no i have to get these guys on the show so thank you so much for coming over here as you guys uh, would have noticed in the introduction i shared um, individual stories of you both but you know like a lot of us are are agitated with the um, politics or we are agitated about um, governments um, like a country's gdp or the access to health and so many other things but there are only few that actually go and do something about it take the matter in their own hand i want to linger a bit more on your personal deeper why like why w- what really really compelled you guys to actually not just crib about it but actually go ahead and take action take me to the initial moments of like you know you were searching ab- about yif and thinking about like should i do it should i not so i think yif was uh, not such a difficult choice to make because uh, uh, i do have a lot of interests in life and uh, i used to be that kid in school who used to be like acha science be like you know, i can do science or i can do humanities and in india we don't have uh, we did not have Uh, a space where you could combine both the subjects together um 
so you know something like okay i wanted to do psychology with science which was not possible when i was in school uh, so there was always this uh, exploratory side to me that i wanted to know this also i wanted to know that also and when i saw the yf program it was that one space which seems so random but it made so much sense to me because there was everything that i wanted to learn about there was women studies there was leadership uh, there was psychology leadership everything all uh, right and uh, as i said okay sure if there's anywhere i can make sense of what i want to do it will be here because uh, you actually get to uh, study to some extent everything uh, that's what this liberal arts is everything that an educated individual should know and must know in order to be able to function um, as a whole human being that just uh, that just called out to me because uh, somewhere it felt like a right fit even in its whole randomness oh nice a poetic touch as well to it <laughs> but like i'm still curious like why why did you you had so much interest on like a lot of us are told that oh do engineering or do uh, doctor like how, why were you so interested in like being at the amalgamation of leadership and humanities and all of those things um i think it's just uh the way i'm wired uh engineering in fact never called out to me and thankfully my parents were also not uh, pushy towards that direction uh so i am a person who would know what i don't want to do but i take time to figure out what i do want to do uh so uh since school until i uh, reached yf it was just okay i know i don't want to do engineering but i took science because i was like maybe i can do architecture then i started preparing for architecture and then i was like okay this is not my thing and then i was studying eco so i was like okay economics i'll study you now uh, but then i ended up studying business study so my journey if you map it also it's just been really like okay science art management commerce i've i've sort of like explored all those fields in order to understand what i really want to do and um, i think when we started working on befort it was a project and when we were doing that it started making sense to me it was just that okay uh, i started feeling okay this is what i want to do and for the first time in my life i could imagine it being a part of my future with everything else that i did it felt like okay there's some level of uh, dissonance it's it's still not me uh, but when we started working in this space it just automatically started falling into place nice nice i think i think that's that's the thing you know that's that's unique about your journey is the randomness you tried so many things and you finally understood that this is what i don't want not a lot of people actually do get that chance epic story what about what about you jonathan sure so um, unlike somia i did pick up that call from engineering right and i did attend bjti but after getting to site i i realized that i was enamored by shows like mega structures and the massive uh, complexity of structures that were built but in india we were working with people who couldn't do basic math right who had no notion of what the future is and hence found it difficult to save in fact i remember at um, my first job um the project manager of a 1000 crore project was saying that the toughest part about his job is not managing such a large project but convincing the laborers that they will withhold a portion of their salary and put it into their employee provident fund and double it when they finish right so in fact they will be giving the 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 laborers a little additional money but they won't able to comprehend that this is something that will happen in the future so we're dealing with really severe mindset cognitive um challenges in india and um, it it made me ask the question right where building so much for people but through my technical education in engineering we never studied about people we had we never mentioned the words like sociology psychology behavioral change uh, or even aesthetics for that matter of fact right so that's what motivated me to explore a plethora of um, of content at the young india fellowship but when i think about my journey in barefoot right uh, i feel that storytelling in retrospect makes uh, people believe that everyone has one transformational moment that launched them into this right and many people do but for many people it's this very very long journey right and um, i would say that when um, barefoot didn't start off as an organization it started off as a thought it started off uh, with somia and me having no idea about the education sector and making an effort to find out about it 
Um, so what we did along with a friend of ours, Nitin, is we went to a whole range of different schools. So these were for-profit schools that charged a lot of fees. They were not-for-profit schools. They were government schools. And we tried to teach kids a content that they would not learn in their school. Right? So we picked topics like artificial intelligence, biomimicry, calisthenics, etc. And um, most importantly, through this all, we were having a lot of fun. Right? We were exploring. The intention was not to run an intervention. Right? The intention was to discover how we can make education fun. And so many things happened in the process. For one, we found that children are much smarter than we give them credit for. They were able to pick up topics like artificial intelligence at that young age. Right. Um, a second thing that happened is during one workshop, our, our projector stopped working. So we made all the children sit around the laptop and start looking at the videos. And we found that the questions increased to a tremendous extent. Now, it could be because we were all sitting on the floor or it could be because of the proximity that we were to each other. Or it could be that it was just a more homely environment. But there were so many nuances like this in teaching and in education itself that were just so interesting. And I would say that it's the interest and the love for learning that kept pulling me deeper into wanting to be into education. And uh, in fact, even at the end of the Young India Fellowship, Soumya and I weren't resolute in launching this as an organization and taking it forward. We searched for other organizations, right? We questioned whether starting an organization is the best thing that we could be doing or being so early into this, whether we should work for another organization and see how we can contribute to the space there. But we just did not find a job as interesting as each other's company. Nice, nice. So, so you decided to uh, scratch your own itch and, and just like start it, <laughs> you know, why not? So yeah, like very, very fascinating story of um, you individuals like thinking in, our, in your own zone and coming together and starting this wonderful organization. How, how has the voice over, like now it's almost been, uh, almost going to be three years now that Barefoot has started, how the voice inside your head uh, transformed over the years? Are you still in love with what you do? Or is, is it the love has grown? Like what's going on? I think uh, it's not one constant voice, honestly. Yeah. It, uh uh, sometimes it's a uh, loving voice saying that, okay, this is great what we are doing. Sometimes it's a questioning voice. Are we doing enough? What else could we be doing? Um, with all the knowledge that we have, with all the resources that we can uh, get into it, how much of an impact are we making? Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think uh, at the base of it, uh, there's this, uh, there's a calmness uh, mm -hmm. and uh, a belief that uh, yes, like, this is what uh, I want to do. And yeah. um, it's really great to feel that peace. It's uh, And it's not peaceful all the time. That's what yeah. I want to say. Like, it is, <laughs> Running an organization uh, is, is not <laughs> peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is very turbulent. But uh, at the end of the day, and uh, uh, I, I've had these uh, moments of feeling where I'm just like, okay, I'm at peace. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes my friend, friends ask me, okay, if if you could be doing anything else, what would you be doing? I was like, why would I do anything else? I chose this. I'm happy with it. And I will continue to do it. Um, so I think that's just very reassuring uh, for me that whenever I look back uh, over the past three, four years, I I just want to do it the same way. Nice, 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 nice. Uh, what about you, Jonathan? So one of my friends who I met at the fellowship had told me that the biggest intervention that's ever going to happen is in yourself. Because every time it leaves your hands or your mouth or your brain, it gets diluted to a certain extent, right? And the only thing that is consistent in every single one of your interventions is you. You're working with different people in different locations at different spans of time with other inputs, but you are completely aware, right? So I would say uh, when we started off, we had a very um, learner level mindset, right? We wanted to work directly with the children and uh, we enjoyed it. And I think that was absolutely necessary. We wouldn't have been able to do a thing that we're doing today if we hadn't got into the classroom in the beginning. Um, but slowly over a span of time, it was um, uh, a systemic lens that started to build up in us. But that didn't just come from us or from theory. It came from the people who we were working with. Do share the number of um, your friend that 
gave such mind blowing you know insights that you are the constant <laughs> you are the constant oh my god that that is so true that is so true like how how was the experience with um working with uh, under resourced communities like what what were the big challenges with them and also what was really fun uh, about working with them I think uh, when we started off at that time, like Jonathan was saying, right, that we were working with all kinds of schools, high and private schools, teach for India classrooms, government schools, um, and uh, we noticed, um, for example, in uh, one of the classrooms, we were talking about identity. Um, so we had this whole uh, music lesson going on, and uh, through uh, music from Pakistan, for example, we would start talking about, okay, guess where is this? Uh, song from and we're like india india and we're like no this is from pakistan and then we would st- start talking about shared identities and go into just talking uh, to the child to introduce themselves uh, so one of the things that happened is a child in this classroom when it would introduce them by their name religion caste but when when we do the same exercise in a high and private school um it's you know uh just your name gender which class you're studying in all of that um so that was one realization that there are different socio economic factors at play uh, it's not that caste does not exist it does exist but who is aware of it the person who has to go through the burdens of it uh, right who has to face challenges around it um so there were different uh, identities at place uh, play in both classrooms uh, like in a high end private school we um, children were not even aware in a city like bombay that you know poverty is there like they were like we've never seen a beggar and we were just like okay what do you like how do you commute to school by a car what do you do in the car we look at our iphone so uh, one person has to live the reality of words big words that we th- like listen to you know uh, just women empowerment or just uh, you know domestic violence or uh, caste based violence one child is having to live through that and there's another child a lot of children like us who aren't even aware about it um so uh, i think that was just a stark difference that we noticed and um, but coming to the part of uh, what's fun uh, when working with these uh, uh, in under resourced schools there's a lot of i would say uh, creativity also involved just because even when we have to think in a resource environment like that we know that we can't suggest uh, for example ki you know in a classroom you put a smart classroom no you don't you probably don't even need to uh, so then you start thinking about okay how is it that i can use uh, stones and leaves to teach so there's a lot of innovation that's happening on ground with uh, you know just that involves lower resources and you can then use the same thing in a high end classroom because you don't just have to spend the money because you have it uh, right you can very well use natural resources you can very well use low cost resources we have these best out of waste competitions in school in every school it will happen but you know it's just one competition one of you do one best out of waste but when that becomes a lifestyle there there's just beauty that emerges like recently we had this online competition for children children from uh, mostly under resourced communities participated you know uh, children of domestic helpers cab drivers and one child make a va- made a vacuum cleaner out of like <sighs> resources that he had at home oh shoot seriously like with all yeah. electric a- every component in it Whoa. Yeah, uh, it, it wouldn't be like a vacuum cleaner yeah yeah like but it will still do the it, work it's a functional yeah. vacuum cleaner oh nice nice that's best out of waste that's best out of waste yep yep <laughs> yeah oh, what about you jantan so there are just so many things right like first is um unlearning has become this popular concept and i would say that working in the development sector requires that to a tremendous extent um this is experiment i recall where they um they show you a blue dot on a white sheet of paper and you look at it for a while and after a little while the blue dot disappears and i think they refer to this phenomena as inattentional blink um so i feel that living in a place like india where you see poverty where you see suffering happen on the street corners it's very easy for it to become a part of your life and you, for you to accept this to be the norm right for you to think that you've seen the extremities of poverty just because you've seen someone right in a particular condition and i think working in the development sector has challenged this notion and uh, increased empathy to a very large extent 
and made me really, really question whether anything that I do is something that I want to do or something that is needed by the community or something that the community wants, right? Yeah, um, yeah. For, for instance, there's the story about a person who uh, saw women traveling a large distance to mm-hmm. draw water back yeah, to their community. Yeah, yeah. So he decided it would be a great idea to dig a well. And he dug the well, didn't mm-hmm. want any credit, went away. Mm-hmm. Shows up a couple of years later to see how the well's doing and a slipper comes right at his head. <laughs> so he wonders what's going on. And it turns out that um, the women in the community used to be abused by their husbands to a terrible extent. Whoa. And this act of walking a large distance to get water gave them yeah. space to be away from home. Oh, nice. Him digging this well took away that opportunity from them. Mm. And the moral of the story is no one asked him to do that. No one <laughs> wanted it. Right? right? It was something right. that he wanted to do. Right. So I feel that every time we understand more context about yeah. a situation, every time we have an opinion of ours that is completely challenged, yeah. it's an extremely humanizing feel, right? It takes you more down the road of learning to live together with others rather yeah. than learning to be as an individual. Yeah. And this is a bulk of our country. Yeah. This is not a small percentage. So if Mm -hmm. we claim to understand people, at least in the country in which we live, it's something that we have to have to engage with. Yeah. Um, And with respect to uh, what must be the most, uh, what's the most fun part about working with this, I would Mm -hmm. say the simplicity. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone would associate complexity with the development sector because of the many, many challenges that are there. And that is true. But when you work at an individual level, when you're speaking to someone, you know, all these theories, jargons, everything, mm. it reduced down to very simple, pure thoughts, right? That are communicated mm. in the smallest way possible. Yeah. Yeah. Like a child may be running past you and just hand you a flower, not wait for your reaction and be gone before you know it. But that nice. makes your day. Exactly. Hundred percent. I, I was actually going to ask you. Uh, I'm so glad you touched on it. That um, th- those those moments of deep satisfaction, you know, um, like some uh, looking at a kid doing something that oh, I started this somehow, initiated this, and this kid is getting advantage of it, or or just looking at them, um, the joy that they are experiencing. I was actually going to ask you about those teeny tiny moments. So so you touched on it. Uh, so ha- did you have any such moments where something really cute happened and that just melted your heart. I think... Uh, preschool so, class uh, in Bagli. <laughs> yeah? Uh, oh, God. <laughs> so once I was selecting, uh, so we were uh, in, a, like, in a tribal school. That was mm-hmm. the first school that we started working with when we decided we want to do this full time. Right. So, um, you know, I was just collecting uh, stones and leaves around the school for a math <laughs> class that I was going to take for first graders. Uh-huh. And I'm just collecting, collecting, and I just turn back. And there's a preschool classroom, and all the children are on their windowsill, uh, just looking at me collecting leaves and stones. Yeah. It was so cute. Like, I just I turned, and <laughs> these tiny faces on the <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh, God, that was so cute. Let's, let's talk about... Um, what is firstly, like, like when I was researching you guys, um, I thought that there is profit and there is non-profit. What is this social entrepreneurship? Like, well, what is it? Oh, that's a really uh, great question. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, we've been through a lot of research on this. Right. So at the time of starting, um, we were two very ambitious kids, right? So we thought yeah. we'll create this hybrid model uh-huh. where one set draws in some kind of income and the other side uh, subsidizes the same activities for uh, under-resourced children, and then at a point we can merge these two together mm. so that um, it isn't a segregated program anymore, but uh, people actually learn the value of each other. For instance, in the school that Somia mentioned, uh, mm. where these cute preschool incidents took place, it was an agricultural community, and kids had a tremendous amount of knowledge. They could tell you which seeds will germinate just no. by looking at it. Right. Uh-huh. So this is not knowledge that uh, people who pretend to be um, you know, agriculturalists and all would even have, or even the, someone teaching this in the classroom. Uh, and there's a lot of value that we could learn from each other. But um, I would say in India, the way that these that organizations are structured generally tend to segregate. Hmm. Um, it's not 
um, it's not encouraged to have a hybrid model uh, where you have a for-profit organization and mm -hmm. you have a not-for-profit organization and they both feed into each other. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there is a new type of company that's come up, which people call a social enterprise, mm -hmm. which is just a for-profit when you look at it on paper. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a social enterprise in its way of functioning. Hmm. So if the sole motive of the organization is not profit, but profit and social development together, it's called a social enterprise. And the biggest question I had when I heard about social enterprises is why isn't every company mandatorily a social enterprise? Like, why is this a new concept and why is this something that people need to actively work towards? Right. And I think that the CSR laws may an attempt to do that. So CSR is corporate social responsibility for mm -hmm. those that aren't aware. Yeah. And companies that have a certain profit, certain valuation, a certain turnover are required to give 2% of their profits in India towards the development sector. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many organizations like the Tatas that used to do this much before CSR was mm -hmm. mandated or mm -hmm. even became popular. And those were social enterprises right from the beginning. Right? Right. So... Right. Um, I would think that a social enterprise is more about a, a concept that is brought into an organization hmm. rather than a formal registration behind it. And right. any organization, yeah. for profit, not for profit, can function as a social enterprise. Right, right. Talk to me. Talk to me about um, how did you guys actually went ahead um, and um, spoke to your parents about it? That you know what I I want to go ahead and do this. Firstly, obviously, social entrepreneur like they would. I, I I don't know, but a lot of them would consider that oh, it's a non profit. You'll just be jhola chap and like asking for money all the time. <laughs> like, how did you uh, talk with your parents? Like, were they super chill about it? What went on? Uh. I think, yeah, I will take that question. You're okay. gonna see me through that journey. Okay. Uh, so the thing is that we uh, uh, we started it as a project at a time that it was very safe for us to do it. Right, you're in right. college, you are already pursuing something, and then alongside you're doing this as a project. When the time came to actually uh, take the decision to take this forward, first you have your internal barriers. Okay. Then once you've crossed that, I started talking to my parents, and my parents were like. Like, okay, you know, it's just a project that you've done. What makes you believe that you can take it forward? Yeah. Now, I also come from a business family. Yeah. So this whole concept of fundraising and NGO, not-for-profit, all of that was, uh, that information itself was lacking because there was no exposure to that at a family level. Mm -hmm. So their concern was coming from a place of protection and love, right? Yes. That, yes. uh just what is it that you're going to do or, yeah. uh, you know, how, how are you going to sustain yourself? Uh, because I, I've made it very sufficiently clear since the beginning that I want to be independent and financially yeah. and financial independence is very important for me. Um, so they're like, how are you going to achieve all of that? And then I would say, okay, you know, we are, we're going to set it up as a hybrid organization and not-for-profit also has a way of functioning. Hmm. Um, so a grant-based model or donation-based model is a valid way for an organization to work. Uh, but uh, it was just somehow never convincing enough because for them, it was just like, okay, you've done, you know, uh, you've done this for one year part-time as a project. That's very different from doing it full-time. Yeah. I think it did take a lot of time for them i would say it took them about two years to uh, accept this whole thing but um, they were supportive in um in not uh stopping me to do it Lovely. so i think that kind of uh support was there since the beginning and when they started seeing us um uh, receive feedback from the community or from funders and we could they could see that okay people are believing Hmm. Um, then they started uh, sort of believing Coming more in it. So uh, I think, uh, so when we had to sort of move to uh, rural, tribal Madhya Pradesh, it was like a big deal. And uh, nobody in my family has uh, really moved out. Right? Uh, hmm. Like my dad, uh, 30 years ago, he went to hostel. After that, nobody in the family has like gone outside. Yeah. And I, I had also always lived at home and directly from living at home, I wanted to go into a village. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but at that time, somehow uh, my dad was very supportive and, uh, you know, he came and he saw the place and he, um, 
uh, again it was coming from the fact that okay we, maybe we don't understand this but people who understand this are believing in these these mm. two individuals mm. yeah. uh, so at uh, so i think uh, that's how they started making sense of it and now it's just uh, uh, reached a place where after a lot of conversations uh, they absolutely believe in it and they support us in many different ways like uh, my father is a part of our fundraising team officially hey, nice. uh, so you know from like not supporting to that it actually has been a great coming on word that's yeah. that's huge that's you <laughs> i think i think yeah. um, sometimes the biggest support that you can give someone is not create and huddle you know just 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 let them go let them figure out things and i think i think that's what your parents did i think i have a similar conversation with my mom um, i always tell her that oh i'll come to india um, and i'll do something in the education space she's initially she always never un- she never understood it and then later i asked her like what's your big challenge she's like i don't want to see you struggle you know that's the that's her main concern that i don't want to see you struggle your earning right now why do you want to like uh, just give it away and do something so i think uh, their moan, m- main motive is um, good for you yeah like you shouldn't struggle but um, i think i think the best thing the parents can do is um, if they don't understand just don't create hurdles um, for someone to just like, explore and that is that is epic what your parents did lovely lovely Very interesting point that you t- touched upon right that your mm-hmm. parents intention is most yeah. often in your yeah. interest yeah. right it's, yeah. it's not like they're opposing you it's that they feel that um, they know better for you and yeah. it comes only from a place of love and care so somya and i came up with this concept of schooling your parents right and i don't mean <laughs> this in a negative way at all i mean right. this in the way that your parents take time <laughs> to teach you how to walk and how to read and how to not drool all over the place and there's so much of investment from their end when we're raising when we're being raised and the least we can do is offer that same amount of patience to them right and uh, see what are their concerns and how we can address it if they think that we that this is a space which is incapable for you to earn show them how you can fundraise get them involved into it if they feel that um, So there's this there's this notion that uh, which every young parent questions as to why is someone giving you money without uh, wanting anything in return it almost seems absurd to them right so it's important to not get upset by questions like these and say oh what do you mean your know, people believe in me that's why they gave me money no but to explain the way that our not for profit works how this is a revenue source like some of you pointed out yeah and you read about it in the books so and I will never write <laughs> you should 100% you guys should <laughs> no I, i think i think as 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 you said like just explain them it's it's a new reality for them as well you know um and i think i think with our generation i personally feel we are very com- we are very comfortable generation um because because for them survival was at stake at, at a lot of times for us it's more of our new realities are uh, we we go to school so so we i i think in future as well there'll be a lot of um, uh, youngsters getting into social entrepreneurship just because of that that you know like there is this maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs where at the base level if every normal thing is happening for you like food shelter and all of those things then you start to think about self actualization then uh, like love connection then self actualization and then self transcendence so i think i think uh, a lot of youngsters in these days might come up like what do you guys think about it like in in uh, about the social entrepreneurship ka future in youngsters do you guys see that pattern uh, i think there are a lot of people who are entering that space but i would also say that people are choosing to be under that pressure or to explore a more safer route uh with us being in that space we've come across a whole lot of people who do want to take that risk and as Jonathan was saying earlier right does it need to be separate from you know what you pursue as your life i was saying the, the thing about capitalism is that it uh, tends to have a template right and uh, that template gets picked up by other countries that are capitalist in nature without adapting it to their specific context so a lot of the businesses markets everything in india cater to a portion that is that is rich right but you do have organizations like amul like um, halls for instance right you have a 50 paisa product 
which reaches a billion people and you suddenly have a very profitable business so it's not um, i feel the notion of business in india is starting to change and needs to rightfully so so that we service a larger group of people and we service them with something that they need and if we can pause to ask that question it automatically creates a social enterprise right um, amul is the perfect example of how you can make a ton of money while making everyone happy and empower people at the grassroots uh talk to me about the money aspect as as we were rightly talking about the capitalism and um, those part when you are per se let's say in social enterprise zone a lot of people like in non profits let's say in non profits it would be that oh like you are just for the social cause but as you rightly pointed out that social enterprise is a profit but with social cause at its center how do you uh, justify your salary when it comes to like how much should i take in order to you know like not take too much or or like allocate because in in a way there is a sense that oh i'm doing it for social uh, cause so i shouldn't take money from it you know like do, do you guys get that question okay so i'll answer it in part yeah. and then i'll uh, uh, leave it for jonathan for sure um uh, one i think one uh, belief that we have is that uh, there is enough for everyone hmm. there is abundance and while we have to serve with everything that we have it does not mean that uh, uh we cannot also have something right, right so right. it uh just a service just a it's not just uh giving everyone else but it's also giving yourself for sure um and the way uh it's not about justifying that okay if i'm uh taking x amount of salary i'm taking it away but rather right. um how much of a salary is it that uh is justifiable yeah. with the impact that you're creating true um and don't limit what you want but create that kind of impact so uh, and that's a uh, cue for jonathan uh, <laughs> but uh, essentially there's uh, the notion earlier as you said was that like, you know uh, a jhola and a kurta yeah, yeah. but uh, there's a whole new kind of uh, sort of uh, social space that we are in now where people like us are joining into the space yeah. but that in no way has to mean that you have to uh sort of give up everything yeah. uh, that you're used to and yeah. you want yeah. um it doesn't mean that it just uh you just have to figure out uh, ways to do that while being true to uh true to who you're serving but mm-hmm. also being true to yourself because unless you're true to yourself you're not going to be able to serve if i'm just like creeping for everything that i need i'm going to burn out in two years yes yeah it's um, for a second if we suspend all these terms like profit and uh, income and things like that and just look at lifestyle and ability right uh, so in order to get your job done you need certain aspects taken care of in order to live you need certain aspects taken care of and um, what needs to change is the mindset that not for profit work is completely separate from our daily life and only when that mindset changes and everyone who's making a profit not making a profit whatever has the interest of someone less fortunate in their mind we have a great world now if we want to intentionally segregate this and say that if you want to do something altruistic you have to give up everything there's no yes. in between space there's no spectrum there's either on a turn or on nothing i think that's quite ridiculous and we are in a society where there are no black and whites anymore and there's a whole spectrum in between right so that becomes the first aspect and uh, what both you and somya um said you used the word justifiable right and that is the key word that it has to be justifiable right like you can't be you can't be ridiculous so for instance um i have a macbook pro but uh, my macbook pro gives me intense battery life which allows me to go to rural spaces without having to worry about charging it through the day um, and my, um i keep telling everyone you take away my laptop and the organization practically like shuts from my end right so it's extremely justifiable to me that i need a device that helps me do my job well but do i need the iphone 10 or 12 or something that's just come out that costs more than the macbook like perhaps not right that's not justifiable it doesn't make sense to be over here and um, i think it's important to acknowledge that 
no 100% i agree i agree like uh, uh, sometimes there is a notion that you know uh, as, as you said that if you're altruistic like like um, uh, jay shetty uh, do, do you guys know who jay jay shetty is yeah so he's a perfect example like he talks about he got trained as a monk and uh, now if you look at him nobody would say he's a monk you know but it's it's about the way you are living your life it, it's we we have this notion in our head that oh yogis and monks should be like this in you know they should give up everything and he's redefining it so are you guys you you are redefining that we can help the society on a very grassroots level but still make sure that we are earning and we are living a good life and as we talked about maslow's hierarchy like you if you want to move ahead you also have to satisfy your own personal needs as well just i wanted to add one more thing mm. uh so we've been asked uh, you know uh, whether people get paid like paid at all in the not for profit sector and i was like okay if somebody is doing a job uh, in our organization how would you justify not paying them exactly it it's a bizarre question to me honestly sure. because why, why not like why why is this the i think the idea is that we people put people in the not for profit sector at yeah. some pedestal yeah uh, but honestly it's we are doing what we love doing yeah we're just trying to do it with people who we don't we wouldn't have interacted with on a day to day basis if we wouldn't have taken that path True. but the uh, reason for doing it is because we love doing it True. and that's about it and it, it is a job it is a career yeah. and why why would anybody not be paid to do it 100% i i totally agree and i think what what's what's uh, really good about y- your approach like when i was researching about barefoot is how strategically you guys are going with it um uh, working with everyone in the system uh making sure that the social impact is there and trying to reach out to as many people and and like as as you said like training them and making it a self sustaining um ecosystem you know and then and then training them enough that they can go ahead and take things ahead and train some one else lovely work talk talk to me about what all things did you guys learn in um, at yif that really prepared you um, for this social entrepreneurship journey that you guys took uh, at ashoka i realized the importance of having a mentor pool and uh, on a support network right because uh, like i've had the the fortune of having uh, like great mental health up till now and never realized the importance of building a support structure but the moment we deep dive into the development sector we realize that the, the highs are great but the lows can be so low that at that moment if you don't have people to reach out to right if you don't have that support system to guide you on how to make a difficult decision or ask questions that um, are difficult to ask it um, it becomes a quite a tricky situation lovely lovely that, that 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 that's really cool when when i when i actually through you guys i came to know about the oh there is something called as yif and ashoka university and when i went through their brochure as well um i i saw such an eclectic um, um group of people coming over there from so many different backgrounds the teachers the students i'm like dude that's the place to be <laughs> i think i think one of the points that you touched um which i was primarily very interested to know is obviously when you start an organization it goes through highs and lows what has been um uh, like very low moment for you that you went in with a certain assumption that oh this will work out but then it completely flipped and you were like whoa what just happened it's not uh, it's not just about uh, your intervention it's you we are working with people who do have a mm-hmm. lot of hardships and when you mm-hmm. see that uh so up close it uh it, it just uh, the reality is much deeper than what even we can touch right, right. we we have chosen to be in the education space some organizations mm. choose to just work with the community everything that they mm. uh, uh you know working with the community to identify what's needed to be done and then take it forward mm. uh so uh i think it just hits you sometimes that uh you're still uh we can only empathize we can never uh, we will never be able to truly understand mm. what and what a person is going through because right. uh, at a very simple level okay uh, 
this whole lockdown everyone has gone into online education hmm. uh, schools are shut down but if we have to ask the basic question where are children safe the answer might not be home for a lot of children but they're still there uh, so there there is a uh, there are a lot of things that we read about in papers but it's very different to sort of um experience it uh, first hand happening mm-hmm. to people who you know when you have to put faces yeah. to those kind of names yeah, that you yeah. read about it it mm-hmm. just uh changes every single year i read up read about farmer suicides in the paper but uh, even when we were living in an agricultural community it did not hit that this is uh, you know that this is the space that we read about in newspapers and it was only at a, the time of drought when there were so many suicides and there was su- um where people started to fall ill and uh, uh, i think it's the continuous exposure to a lot of hardships pain and suffering that can take a toll on you and don't get me wrong this is not the only thing that the development sector offers right it's not just a, a huge pool of things bringing you down not at all but there's a lot of it interspersed right and um, uh, initially it uh, it was difficult to cope with and i think the uh, my source of strength at this moment was somya um and for this reason we never recommend to anyone to try anything alone we say it you know find find at least one person at least one person who believes in your idea and you can do this together because it's needed it's really really needed um these highs and lows right it becomes uh, it becomes so important to celebrate quick wins because true, uh, true. in that journey for a vision or a mission which ne- may never be achieved because the situation may change yeah yeah right or uh, you're exposed to so much it's so important to celebrate when something nice happens when yes. when a child fares well when a school does something that they're proud of when people take initiative when um, you are appreciated when yeah. you appreciate others and the list of quick wins is endless it yeah. really really is endless because um, uh, just think about it right mm-hmm. if uh, if i were to give you 150 rupees yeah in the city and ask you to bring about social change yeah it would be quite difficult for you to for think sure. of something that yeah. can happen yeah. Yeah. you take this game 150 rupees and you go to a village Mm. and you can buy a child a pair of slippers which now allows them to walk 4 kilometers to get to school Ooh. and you've created access to education yeah yeah right yeah. this is the level of social impact that you can have with a limited range of funds and there yeah. are there are wins like these all around you it just becomes very important to be on the lookout for it acknowledge yeah. it and celebrate it oh man I, we we could just end the podcast over here <laughs> <laughs> the way you summarize it oh man i loved it so when i started to research you guys um the point that i saw was john then you are a, a civil engineer um somya you had a business background but nobody of uh, no one from you had that educational training so throughout your journey by far did you ever feel that imposter syndrome as they talk about that uh, I I feel I don't know enough to actually work on this has that ever happened uh so I feel that uh, you know it's a very uh, vicious cycle like you know when I I'd be, like when we were doing business studies I would be the sole thing okay um, go for internships when you I want to do internship they'll be like where is your work ex so in order to do the internship you need work experience but when you have to do a job then you need an internship so there has to be some starting point yeah yeah and I think that's what we acknowledge that we while we may not have uh, studied education at, when we started hmm. uh, we had been students hmm. and we started working with students hmm. understanding what is it that you know just trying to understand from our own experience of working with students uh, what is happening what is working so there was this time when we were at the fellowship where we were learning hmm. having been learners all our lives and then we were also teaching So oh, nice. that was a very unique combination for us because we could observe ourselves in both the scenarios and then uh understand the learner and the teacher mindset and begin sort of merging the two and uh I think there there would have been like there were moments where you just question but um 
the fact you're there just okay i'm here now i am yeah. learning and i want to learn and i want to know how this field functions and i want to contribute to it i think that's uh that's way more important um yeah this is such a deep question i could do um, like an hour on it in itself yeah cuz it starts off as questioning what is a degree right how was it created when was it created for whom was it created you now have teachers and for no fault of theirs at all right it's a it's a system and a mindset that's brought to it you have teachers that studied in school went to teacher training college and came back to school and have never left the education system and then you have people who are upset that they don't know how to bring life skills to education right where is the exposure outside that of the schooling system so in fact like it's so where a point where we are reimagining the system to such an extent or where we ask the question who should be a teacher right should a teacher be a facilitator or should a teacher be teaching in the classroom should the role of the teacher being to identify who in the community can bring everything that a child needs to a classroom in order to get it done and that's the role that we played initially that of a facilitator right so um two things one is uh, the philosophy that we had and we chose the name barefoot itself because barefoot evokes a feeling of being sensitive to the ground that you tread on right so sensitivity is really really important and the second is a combination of basic principles right one is acknowledging what you have to offer second acknowledging what you have no idea or no clue about or the fact that there is a lot that you know nothing about and the third is who can help you understand that right and if you work with these three principles in a sensitive manner i think you will never do something that you don't know about or do something with an ill intention but there's no correct handbook to parenting or teaching or raising a child your intention needs to be pure and children need to sense that purity in your intention I thoroughly thoroughly agree with you. I mean, uh I I in in I think I think you did a great job in putting that one hour content in just like few few minutes. I think I think there was so much to unpack over there. Um before before I um ask my last question, what's what's in store for Barefoot um in the future and what's actually going right now? Okay. Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot uh, a lot is happening at Barefoot uh, this year we actually merged with another organization uh, called Lantern and the idea was that uh, we had been working in the pre primary space and uh, again this is also an organization working in mumbai and they had been working with school principals uh, at the primary age group mm-hmm. and we just thought we we'll partner with this organization and together we can add a lot of value to the school uh because when you come together it's uh you just expanding the range of children who you're offering and their approach and our approach was very similar to work with the system to work with the principal to work with the mm-hmm. teacher mm-hmm. when you started that collaboration we realized that okay maybe uh you know this can be more than a partnership it we can just merge into one organization right. and not only increase the number of schools that we impact but the depth of the intervention with these mm-hmm. schools mm-hmm. uh so uh that's something exciting that has happened and through the uh merger now that we've merged we have uh we have been working with children uh to provide online education to the uh you know to the uh, schools that we work with um and uh, we also uh, we just i think uh, we're launching a new program which is a summation of our journey uh, which is an entrepreneurship program for school principals um so there are skills from the entrepreneurship uh, journey that you can take and you can apply it into a school so that these yeah. schools become a resilient organization because uh, they aren't just schools they are centers for the community yeah i think i think the best things that that, that is happening to you guys uh, is because you don't know you didn't come up in this field with a lot of background knowledge you're questioning everything like why is it getting done in this way why not why not this way right <laughs> so where can where can uh, people like uh, follow barefoot's journey and um, where where you guys most active okay currently we are most active on instagram mm-hmm. and uh, 
uh, and also LinkedIn people can personally hit us up. Uh, right. So yeah, that's where we are at. Kind of what, what's the handle for the Barefoot? Is it is just Barefoot Edu? Barefoot Edu. Yeah. Lovely, short and simple. My last question to both of you is: What is that one lesson that you learned that if I give you a megaphone, you would shout out from it that you didn't know before, but now you know it, and it has changed things for you. It's a really interesting question because uh, there's no way that you could have gone on a path other than the one that you have, right? And uh, one thing that has always brought like Soumya and me a lot of satisfaction is when we look back on documents from our first year or even before registration, we are never embarrassed by it. We always feel that there are things that we have uh, we now know that we didn't know at that particular time. But we asked questions and we occupied ourselves to the maximum bandwidth, right? So there was a time when we started working in early childhood education and we realized that we have uh, um, no idea about foundational learning and it's a very sensitive age and we should be getting, we, should we be getting into this? Should we be working with specialists? Um, and I bought a child development book and just started reading through it. We contacted child psychologists and we asked them questions. We ran our interventions by people who were much more knowledgeable than us, right? So all of that uh, happened in a very organic way. And um, it comes back to the previous question that you asked, right? How do you do something that you have no experience in? Acknowledge what you have to offer, acknowledge what you are lacking and who can help you get there. And uh, as long as you're doing that, it's, it's, um, it's really, really good. So I would... Uh, um, we didn't know this, but it happened organically to reach out and collaborate, right? And I think that's something that we should shout out. Um, and it's embedded in the DNA of our organization because right from the beginning, from project number one till now, there is not a single project that we do completely on our own without involving others in, right? And it's this mindset of collaboration that even led to a merger. Right? That's the ultimate form of collaboration. Right? Where you welcome someone into your space and say, what's mine is yours and yours is mine. Lovely, lovely. So what about you? Reflect, but also act. Mm. Um, so acting is better than wondering. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, just uh, because until you start, you will just never know what's going to happen. And I'm a very big planner, but still you cannot plan everything, right? So, at the end of the day, you will only know how that plan emerges once you start doing it. And not, yeah. it's going to mean nothing if it's just in your laptop or if it's in your, on yeah. paper. So just go for it, start something, whatever makes sense to you at that moment. Uh, because without that, uh, the, uh, you're just probably going to never start. True, 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 true. I agree. So big lessons out here. Reflect, act, collaborate lovely lessons to shout out from a megaphone guys i would say they are so young and they are still caring so much they have they have such an empathetic heart towards um, society and and the kids that are coming up the future of india they are shaping it through their work what i love about them is the why not attitude like questioning everything like we bringing entrepreneurship to to principles why not you know, like reimagining schools, making it a learning aid, making sure that every kid is involved, involving principal, working with the government, making sure that it's the ultimate goal that they have for the kids is being satisfied. Do follow Barefoot's journey. I'll be linking all the handles of them and all my research in the show notes. If you haven't subscribed, do subscribe. Send me a message on Instagram. It's Amit underscore Pandey is my handle on Twitter and Instagram. Do share comments, feedback, some insights that you really enjoyed from this show. And do tag Jonathan and Somi. I'll be ha uh, putting their Instagram handle as well. Thank you so much, Soumya and Jonathan, for coming on this show. This has been such a deep and epic conversation. Thanks for having us, Thank Soumya. Thank you so much, really, really lovely. Yeah, really thoughtful questions. And uh, yeah, so much emphasis on 
us being young people might think that we're in preschool as well <laughs> yeah that's where the care is coming from <laughs> yeah so thank yeah. you so much guys thank you so much this is amit pandey and you were listening to wish i knew that before see you next time <laughs>